The second reading for the Feast of the Solemnity of the Most Holy Body and Blood of Christ, commonly referred to as Corpus Christi, is a very short but significant uh, reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. And in this passage, the context here is Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he's preparing to address some abuses that are taking place in the celebration of the Eucharist, which he calls the Lord's Supper. And before he gets to the abuses that he's going to address and correct, he first lays a foundation for what the Lord's Supper is by comparing it to some of the sacrifices in the Temple of Israel and contrasting it with some of the sacrifices that were often offered in pagan temples. And in that context, he says in chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, these very important words, the cup of blessing, which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. End of second reading. Very short one today. Okay, so what's going on here, and why does the church choose this for the Feast of Corpus Christi? Well, it should be obvious here that Paul's talking about the two principal elements of the Lord's Supper, the cup of wine and then the bread of the Eucharist. But in this context, he says something very interesting about them. First, he uses ancient Jewish terminology to describe them. This is interesting. So when Paul uses the term cup of blessing, on the one hand, you can just infer from that that he's talking about a cup that receives a blessing. That's obvious. Um, Just like to this day, people will say a blessing before they eat a meal that consists of food and drink. But in a first century Jewish context, as we know from reading other ancient Jewish writings outside the Bible, Paul appears to be using here a technical term, which we actually find represented in later rabbinic writings, to describe not just any cup, but a specific cup that was actually used in certain religious meals, certain celebratory meals like the Passover meal. So if you, for example, look at the Babylonian Talmud, there's a whole tractate called Berachot, means blessings. The Talmud is a 5th century collection of ancient rabbinic traditions, sayings of the rabbis, many of which are attributed to rabbis who lived at the time of Jesus and the time of Paul. And in that tractate on various blessings, you actually have the exact same expression that Paul uses here, except in Hebrew, to refer to the cup of blessing. And if you read through the writings of the rabbis, we actually have examples of the kind of blessing that would be uttered over the cup of wine that was used at the Passover meal or other sacred meals in which a cup of blessing was drunk from. And so, for example, here in the Mishnah, another collection of rabbinic traditions from the 3rd century, early 3rd century, around 200 AD. Listen to the words of this ancient rabbinic blessing over the cup of wine. Quote, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. End quote. That's from Mishnah Barakot 6.1. Sound familiar? Yeah, it should, because it's very similar to the blessing utilized in the ordinary form of the Roman rite, the ordinary form of the Mass, to this day, right? Um, So when the priest utters a blessing over the wine of the Eucharist, he is, in a sense, echoing the kind of Jewish blessing, some of the words of the ancient Jewish blessing, that Paul would have utilized over the cup of blessing, and that arguably Jesus himself would have uttered at the Last Supper, the Passover meal there. So when Paul talks about the cup of blessing here, he's referring specifically, in all likelihood, to the Passover cup, which has now become part of the Eucharistic liturgy of the early church, the the liturgy of the Lord's Supper. And then secondly, Paul says the bread that we break. Now again, this obviously on just on one level refers to a common loaf that has to be broken and distributed amongst the members of a meal in order to eat it. However, it also has a specific liturgical context because part of the rite, ancient Jewish rite of Passover was the breaking of the unleavened bread and its distribution amongst the members of the Paschal Feast. And we see this same liturgical act of breaking and sharing bread 
actually was one of the earliest names for the Lord's Supper that we have in the New Testament. So, for example, if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, after Pentecost, Peter describes the, the practices, spiritual practices, of those who have recently been baptized. And in that context, he says these words, or well, not he doesn't say this, but Luke says this in Acts, quote, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers, right? So it's the same terminology being used here. Well, most scholars agree, and this goes back to ancient times, that the breaking of the bread is a specific reference to the Eucharist, the Eucharistic celebration of the early church. Because one of the key rites in the celebration of the Lord's Supper was the breaking of the bread. So you'd have a single loaf, it'd be broken and then distributed amongst the members who were communing. And it would symbolize the unity, right, of the people celebrating the meal. So when Paul says the cup of blessing we bless and the bread which we break, those are both references to the bread and wine of the Eucharist. Now with that in mind, the key term here that we want to highlight is Paul's use of the word communion or participation. This Greek word here is koinonia. We've actually seen it used elsewhere in Paul's writings when he talks about the koinonia of the Holy Spirit, right? It means to have something in common. It means to participate, to have a share in something. It means to commune, to have a common spiritual bond with one another. And here Paul's saying that mysteriously in the cup of wine and the bread of the Lord's Supper, we have a koinonia, a fellowship, not just in the body of Christ, but also in his blood as well. Um, so this is one of the most striking passages in Paul that shows that Paul um, does not consider the Eucharist to be just ordinary bread or ordinary wine. Rather, he clearly teaches that through partaking of the cup, and partaking of the bread, we somehow have a real share, not just in the body of Christ, but also in his blood. We have a real participation in his body and in his blood. And this is going to be one of the foundational texts for the church's doctrine of the mystery of the real presence of Christ. Right? It's not a purely symbolic remembrance. It's also a real participation in the mystery of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection and his body and blood that are given for us on Calvary. But it's not just Eucharistic, it's also ecclesiological. It's also a mystery of the church itself. Because notice what Paul says here, because there is one bread, we who are many are one, what? Body. Now, if you read through the letters of Paul, you're going to see it over and over again. One of Paul's favorite ways of referring to the mystery of the church is the image of the body of Christ. So, what he's doing here is he's drawing an analogy between the body of Christ that's represented by the one bread and the body of Christ that's constituted by the church itself. So he's not just talking about the mystery of the Eucharist here, he's also talking about the mystery of the church.